first time seeing a guy get killed, I was like five years old. And that was probably like the first like interaction I probably had with like death. A light and then a guy on the floor. There was like paramedics and I seen and my mom just grabbing me because I just stood there the whole time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome back to another episode of the Muslimi Experience I'm your host, Brother Bona Muhammad Joining me on this amazing journey of exploring Muslims from all different walks of life. You know, we've talked with imams, we've talked with artists, we've talked with activists. We're trying to dig deep into the Muslim community and find those really important and interesting stories that nobody's really talking about. And so today we have a guest who I am super excited to chat with because I really feel the work he's doing is so unique and it's so needed in our community. I'd like to welcome my brother, Abdurrahman Warsame, to join us. Assalamu alaikum, akhi. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa What's going on? We're doing good, man. Alhamdulillah, you good? Alhamdulillah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Akhi, wallahi, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. I'm, I'm very honored to have you here, and partly because the work that you're doing and your story is, I think, so remarkable. And it's one that I feel the Muslim community really needs to get a hold of and we need to amplify. Because yeah. it's, it's not very often you meet people that are doing what you're doing. So I, I'm setting it up, but I want to kind of talk more about yourself and your journey. But... Um, how would you introduce yourself if somebody was to ask you, you know, who are you, what do you do? What, what, what would be the first thing you would offer? I would say um, I'm, I'm Abdurrahman, uh, or Samer, um, Somali Muslim, um, and I'm in recovery. Mm. Um, and so what that means for myself is uh, showing up for myself every day, pushing myself every day, um, and taking it one day at a time. Um, Allahu Akbar. So that word recovery... I mean, that's a very loaded term. A lot of people in our community, may, they may not even really understand mm -hmm. that type of terminology. What does recovery mean and, and what exactly are you in recovery from? So re what recovery means to me is, um, you know, uh, and it looks different for every single person, um, is recovering from my addiction. Um, so I struggled with addiction for a time period in my life and it was very detrimental to my life. Almost killed me, almost died from it. And um, Alhamdulillah, I've been sober for four years and a few months now. Alhamdulillah. And I've been uh, 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 doing work in the community around addiction and recovery. And it's been, um, you know, a fruitful journey. Um, very much self-discovery. Very much learning a lot about myself and in the process trying to help people. Mm. Um, you know, addiction is something that's such a taboo topic. It's so hard to talk about. I remember the first time that um, it actually happened, I remember the anxiety that I was feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that um, you shouldn't feel, you know, especially if it's something that you've overcame. Um, but it's a, it comes from stigma. It comes from a lack of knowledge, ignorance. And it's something that really um, we're working hard to break every day, you know, break that barrier, change that narrative, uh, make a difference in our community by, you know, sharing stories, sharing my story, sharing other people's stories, because this is something that uh, impacts our community in a way that people would never guess and never think. It, it's in the nooks and crannies and the crevices of our communities and people are dying from it every day. Um, and it's such a, a you know, um, sad thing to think about, but it's something that um, is so real. Mm. And, and we have to talk about it and carry these stories because there's so many people I know, Allah alhamdulillah, that, you know, nobody is going to ever be able to tell their story because they're not here with us. Um, and it's a silent cry, really. Mm. You know, but um, that's, that's what the work is. Bro, especially in our community, the East African community, yeah. this is something that it's, you know, it's aib, it's shame, yeah. you don't want to talk about it. Yeah. We know a lot of brothers, subhanAllah, who struggle and, you know, things happen in their lives. Maybe they go to jail, maybe they get killed mm -hmm. and the families will completely sweep it under the rug. Yeah. You know, I, I, t I think I told you a story previously where I had a friend of mine, a family friend who... You know, for many years, I was told was overseas visiting some relatives. Yeah. And I just then afterwards, I found out the whole time he was in jail. Yep. You know, <laughs> and literally like two, three years, we thought, oh, he's visiting family. And they, yeah. the family just didn't want to say anything. They just, yeah. you know, and I wish they didn't feel that way because then we could have helped support them. We could have learned from their lessons. We could have been there as a support system. But because everyone is so worried about our own you know, perception and how the community views us, a lot of times the real work is not being done. Yeah. So I want to congratulate you for also being transparent and being vulnerable, making yourself vulnerable to that type of you know, critique because it's not something that our community is used to. Yeah, you know, I mean, honestly and truly, like, um, and this is no disrespect to any viewer that may feel it, um, the reason why I share my story isn't really honestly fully for the general public initially. Mm. Right, the initial impact is meant for a person that was just in my shoes, that I, I was just in their shoes. Um, because honestly, I, I never looked at somebody when I got sober, or, you know, before I got sober, 
and seen somebody that I could relate to because it was something that I dealt with in, in my life that um, most people that were in that lifestyle were either dead, you know, in jail, uh, homeless, or just like me, right, um, and still struggling with it. And so, honestly, it's to show people that recovery is possible, one, and two, to educate people on the, on the outside that if you've never been through addiction, how can you help that person or how can you understand them at the very least, mm. right, so that you don't judge them and so that they can have that open door to you. Right. Or if you want to help them, then you will be able to. But in order for you, people to be comfortable enough to, to ask for that help, you have to understand them or at least show them that you care. Mm. Um, and I feel like sometimes it comes from frustration, it comes from ignorance and arrogance. You can call it what you want. Um, but truly and honestly, we just don't understand that experience of somebody that is struggling with addiction and, and, and understanding that this isn't um, you know, something that is just happening. It's not the problem. There's so much things that are underlying, you know, mm. and, and it's, it's um, it, there, there's deeper, there's a deeper meaning behind it. And I feel like a lot of times people don't understand it. They don't know how to deal with it. And a lot of that comes from, you know, our subconscious because of what we've been, you know, presented as kids. You know, when you look at, you know, what we used to watch as, as kids on TV, you would see somebody that's struggling with addiction as somebody that's homeless, you know, got a broken tooth and, you know, asking for money, and that's not how it always looks like. Mm. Most of the time, it doesn't look like that. Mm. You know, I've in this line of work that I've been in for you know the past few years, I've come across people from all walks of life struggling with addiction. You know, look so different, different ages, different gender, different you know background, um, and it's something that is um, it's so profound because it's like this is an issue that's facing people all around, and obviously there's a reason behind it, and it's the the truth of it is that we don't know how to express our emotions. Mm. You know, Islamically, we are taught to rely on Allah, but we also have been given this blessing of emotions mm. that as Muslims, we have shut out completely. Mm. And the after effect of that can come and look different for in so many different ways. Yep. Um, and just it's unfortunate that, you know, one of the most common ways is addiction because mm. uh, we're looking for a way to cope. Mm. Uh, coming from, you know, Somalia, my mom came here in 95, you know, struggling with war, poverty, famine, and all these different things coming to America for a better life. You know, my mom never taught me to cope. Um, mm -hmm. So many people have never been taught how to cope. You know, on the other side, being a man, you know, how do you deal with your emotions? Are you expected to deal with your emotions? Are you expected to man up? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I was raised by a single mother. So my mom didn't even know how to be a man because she's not a man. But she taught me what it, she thought was it, it was to be a man. And that's mm -hmm. how it is in so many Muslim households. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You got absent fathers. You got, you know, um, mothers that are raising their kids. They got so many kids. You know what I mean? And you know how it is in East Africa. You got like 10 kids in the house. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's, it's so often that we are not that taught that what that, what that means. And, and I, it's no blame to anybody. Yeah. You know, it's just, it is what it is. Mm. But uh, how do we move forward from that? And the truth is, it, it's, it's through that self-discovery and helping people and understanding that we're all in one and that, that this is something that affects all of us. Mm. And the only way for us to move forward is to understand first and foremost that this is an issue. And then, and then figuring out how to deal with that, it looks different for every single person. Mm. But in order for us to help one another, we have to understand each other. Mm. And so that's where that self-disclosure aspect comes in, that I have to tell you about my experiences and how you know community received me and all of these negative things that happened to me in my life, but only to help people understand that because I'm holding a grudge or anything, just mm. more so that, hey, this is how we can help each other mm. by being more open, compassionate. You know what I mean? Uh, home, you know, like that we have to be merciful to one another mm. in order for us to, you know, um, move forward as a community because this happens so often. Well, you, you said a really important point, which I think is, you know, especially the intergenerational trauma that yeah. a lot of us are coming with, like my family escaped war, your family yeah. escaped war. We, we, it's hard to us for us to even unpack that. What does yeah. that mean? You know, like for our parents and family to leave everyone they knew, to leave their country, to leave like any sense of normalcy they had to come to this completely foreign place raising kids in a culture you don't really fully understand, a non-Muslim culture that doesn't really have our best interests and minds at times, right? So, of course, like, the, the recipe is there. Like, it's a perfect storm for all types of different issues. But let's 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 go back. I want to actually talk about your childhood. I want to talk about, you know, you growing up because you grew up in a community that I'm very familiar with. I'm yeah. in Minnesota, you know, it's. Yeah. Uh, I was joking last time I was there that I'm related to about half the city because, yeah. mashallah, we, you know, East Africans roll quite deep out there, yeah. you know, alhamdulillah. Um, what was your experiences like coming to, to America? Do you remember what age you came? Were you born in America? I was or did born, you, I was oh, born. you were born in America. Yeah, my mom came in 95. I was okay. born in 97. Okay, my So she came with my older brother and my older sister. Right. And then my other sister, Zahra, was born uh, a year later in, mm. in uh, 96. Mm. And then I was born in 97. Okay. Yeah. So coming to America now, you're born and raised in America. What was your 
did you feel at any point different? Like, was it something that, I, I don't know, a lot of East Africans started arriving in the 90s, so probably, you probably came with that wave where mm -hmm. there was a lot more people, but what was your earliest experiences and rem like memories of being a young Muslim Somali kid in Minnesota? Yeah, the easy way, easiest way to put it is, um, it was like, growing up, I remember like, I have vivid and faint memories of my childhood um, as a family, as a whole. Um, when my mom and dad were together, but they divorced when I was four. Mm. And shortly after that, it was almost as if, like, I just remember moving every year, you know, um, from one place to another, to another, to another. Um, you know, my mom wouldn't be home because she'd be always working. Um, you know, we used to call each other Ayala's Kuris, you know, like we raised each other, mm. you know. Um, and the reason why was because we we lived in that kind of household where my mom would be working because she's trying to provide for us. And so she'd just be like, don't open the door for nobody. Um, and so, you know, throughout that time period, I really look at it as like my childhood was fun, honestly, because I was so, you know, and you see this so often in Muslim households where it's like, it comes from a pride, a protection aspect, where our parents, even if they're struggling, they will make sure that no way in hell will my children realize that this is, that I'm yeah, struggling. Yeah, man. Um, you know, a funny story is, um, I remember when we were kids, we used to play this game called, called Bounty Hunter. Mm. where um, you know, when the lights would go out pretty much every other month and when the lights would go out we would all my mom would grab like she would try to make it as fun of an experience as possible so she would grab a bunch of beds and put it in the living room so we all sleep together in the living room put candles together you know maybe order some pizza or something like that or cook and um, I remember when the lights would be out because you know you have no lights you only have like faint candles mm -hmm. we would grab bottles you know because there would be so many bottles in the house like plastic bottles and we'd play a game where we would chase each other with flashlights and, you know, literally chase each other in the house. And mm. It was called Bounty Hunter. Mm. And I remember reminiscing with my brother, like, this is like COVID time. You know, we back back home. It's the first time all of my family's back home together for the first time in years. Mm. And I remember uh, reminiscing with my brother and we were like, yo, like, we used to play this game having fun. Not having a damn clue that my mom is probably, like, stressed, stressed out, because, out because she can't even pay the bills. Damn. You know, but we didn't feel it, though. We were having fun, having the time of our lives. I think that I started realizing early into my adolescence, you know, maybe 12, 13, that we were struggling financially, that we were um, not at the, you know, best place in life, started having a lot of, you know, anger. Um, and I feel like that's where all of that started and began, you know. Um, and it just continued from there, like 13, 14. And it just continued until at one point I broke. Mm. You know. Which area in Minnesota did you guys grow up in? Were you always in the South, same area? South Minneapolis. South Minneapolis. Yeah, we moved around in the suburbs too. Mm. I never stayed in a place for too long though. Mm. You know, different school. I, alhamdulillah, like the thing was, was up until sixth grade, I lived, um, I, 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 I lived in the metro area. I always lived in the metro area, but there was a school that I went to called Tariq al mm. and they had buses everywhere. Mm. And so I went to the same school, but it would be a different neighborhood, right. different Duxi. Mm. Um, you know, like, um, or madrasa, you call it, but it was always moving, mm. moving different house. Uh, it was it was an experience. Yeah, I can imagine. Subhanallah. Yeah. What what point did you? Uh, because I mean, people may not know this. Again, I'm just trying to paint the picture. But like, there are some pretty rough areas in, yeah. in Minneapolis. Like, yeah. it, you know, it's not all like just Prince and uh, you know people yeah. think it's like it's a chill out place. But oh, I mean, yeah. there's some pretty like bad areas, and yeah. you know, a lot of times the Muslims are stuck in many of these like low income housing communities and, yeah, and yeah, projects yeah. where basically you know we're we're just integrated into this slum. Yeah. Um, do you remember feeling like you know okay I'm. My world is a little bit different than the world everyone else is exposed to. Yeah, my first time seeing a guy get killed, I was like five years old. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was my mom lived in this house called on Portland Avenue. I remember, and um, the top floor, it was I believe somebody's room. I don't remember whose room it mm. was, but I just remember it was nighttime, and I just remember seeing like a light and then a guy on the floor, and that's all I remember. And I remember like later on, like there was like paramedics, and I seen. And my mom just grabbing me because I just stood there the whole time, you know. But I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know like I was dying or anything like that. But I just remember seeing that though, like, um, and that was probably like the first like interaction I probably had with like death, mm. you know. But um, yeah, I mean, you've seen that a lot, you know. Like I, the next time probably was like not getting killed, but uh, like a shoot shooting and stuff like that. I was like seven years old. Mm. Um, my mom worked in a neighborhood called Cedar Riverside. Yeah. which is a predominantly East African neighborhood. Notorious neighborhood. Yeah, yeah you know, everybody knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's like a, a 
very uh, well-known neighborhood for good and bad, mm. you know, uh, very much, you know, poverty struck and low income. Mm. I got a lot of issues on its own, but uh, it's very beautiful. A lot of khair. That's, yeah. It's funny, it is, when I grew up, I only knew that neighborhood, so I thought yeah. Minnesota was just that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Minnesota was just Cedar and all yeah. the restaurants, because yeah. I love it. That's the place where I go to naturally, yeah. but yeah. now getting older, I realize, oh, no, this is the hood hood. Like, yeah. There's a lot of crazy stuff, but I felt so comfortable there that yeah. it was kind of hard for me to imagine, but yeah, for sure, it's a yeah. very, very dangerous area. My mom worked in um, this, Brian, this place called Brian Coyle. Mm. It was a community center. Um, you know, all the kids would go there. I remember literally we would, my mom would have the keys and every morning before we get picked up in school and some, there was a time period where the buses in the beginning didn't pick us up from there. So she would go to work and before she would go to work, like 6, 7 a.m. we would go to there and the Brian Cole wouldn't open until like 9. But we would have the keys. She would have the keys and she would let us get into the computer room. So we'd be in the computer room. We'd get picked up and dropped off from that area in Cedar mm-hmm. and we would be there every day for the after school programs. Every program we would be a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, and so alhamdulillah, with within that, what what was good was that we had a sense of community as kids. Mm-hmm. Where we would go back there, um, and we would be in their community. You know, like the after school programs, the summer programs, and it was fun and it was amazing. You know, and it, um, you know so many amazing memories during that time period. Okay. So no matter what the situation was, because of that connection, mm. um, it was it was good. I mean, and you were always connected to Dean as well growing y- up. You yeah, know, you know, popular. growing up, so like. When I was a kid, I never went to madrasa. Mm. You know, like it wasn't until my first time, I think I was like maybe 12. Like there would be times before that where I would go for like a weekend mm. or maybe two weekends and then I would get pulled out. You know what I mean? Because the money you can't pay. Mm. But um, my first time going, I think like it was my seventh grade, um, the summer of seventh grade going into eighth grade was the first time I went to Duxi and like actually like was, I started with Hinget, so like the Arabic uh, letters. Mm. And they had this thing called the Green Book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, I remember I was so frustrated because I was with a bunch of five-year-olds, <laughs> you know. But it was something that, um, honestly, yeah, it was very life-changing. Mm-hmm. And, and throughout that time period, there was a lot that happened within my family. Um, you know, a lot of life events that, alhamdulillah, like, although it was very, very, you know, um, you know, a lot of bad things happened, it brought me near to Dean because I, didn't ha- I never had that experience or that system. Mm-hmm. in front of me i didn't even know how to pray bro like you know what i mean like i didn't know what at- yeah. i remember we went to this school you know and they had the prayers and stuff but i didn't even know what i was saying i just followed the actions you know what i mean but i didn't know at- yeah. i didn't know like uh, even how to read the quran nothing like that and even though like i would be in the Arabic classes or whatever but it was just like you know like i didn't know mm-hmm. and um it wasn't until that time that i feel like i had a very strong sense of belonging when it came to dean and I was in the class, in the masjid. I finished the Quran from, I, I started when I was like 13, I, uh, the Hingat. I started Quran class that same year, December, it was 2011. Mm. And eighth grade year started and I finished Quran in 10th grade, so when I was 16. Mm. And it was, alhamdulillah, throughout that y- year from when I was like 13 up until I was like 17 years old. It was, alhamdulillah, like I feel like I had a strong sense of deen in my life where I was connected to the masjid. You know, I was going to halaqas. I was learning different books. You know what I mean? Um, and, and these different things really helped me, keep me grounded during that time where I, I felt like I had a very strong sense of faith. Mm-hmm. Um, my brother got arrested later on in my senior year. And I feel like that's where it took like a very different, you know, mm-hmm. uh, turn for me mm-hmm. where I really you know started getting involved with the wrong the wrong places wrong scenes and very quickly i fell into addiction it was just like within months really yeah i want to talk about that obviously but then i want to go back a little bit because you still kind of dibbled and dabbled in art at that time as well yeah yeah i wrote i used to i used to write man i have like poetry from like when i was a kid like i used to write on um because my brother and my sister used to do poetry when i was a kid Mm. my uncle used to do poetry Talking about it like 10, 2010. Yeah, and then Somalis are also the, the nation of poets. Yeah, so, so I, I grew up around yeah, that. I used to go did. to like open mics in the community and stuff like that. Mm. And I used to think it was so cool because mm. it just sounded so like flowy and nice. Mm. But um, I never really took it up upon myself till I was maybe 13, tried, trying it out, watching, you know, my brother and my sister doing poetry and I would just write something. But um, it would be on and off. I didn't, you know, I would write like what really like would help me was like throughout my addiction, I would write too. You know what I mean? It was like, like a, and I never showed it to like my friends or nothing like that during that time because I didn't want them to think 
a type of way, but I would always write and I would store it in my phone. A lot of poems I lost, you know what I mean? Because I would always be losing phones, flipping the phone, getting another phone. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I never really had like um, the stability in that, but I would, whenever I'd have the time I would write, I didn't, I feel like I didn't continue in, you know, stability with my writing until like I got, got sober. Mm -hmm. But I was, I always appreciated art. I would see it with my family, um, with people outside in the community. I always, you know, whether it was plays, my first time acting, I was uh, 17 too, actually. It was, um, and I, I did a play, but um, I, I remember even going, I like, there was this class that there was this place called Bedlam Theater in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. It, it ended up, a masjid ended up buying it and it ended up becoming a masjid. But before that, I remember we was kids. We would go over there and they would do like different practices. Um, I forgot this one. It's like, you have to say a word fast and the other person says another word oh, fast. Oh, it's like improv games. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was, we would do, do things like that as kids. So, I, I mean, I, I feel like as a, as a kid, I was really surrounded around arts. There's three theaters. In, there used to be three theaters now there's only two mm. in just that small Cedar Riverside neighborhood mm. there used to be three and so we would always go around from one to another yeah I brought that up because it obviously connects to your, your journey later on the fact yeah. that you know now you're a poet and a writer as well so yeah. the, but those inclinations were kind of started early on in your life yeah so now let's talk about high school um, you know your brother gets arrested obviously it's a very difficult time I can only imagine you know yeah. especially like being a young man and you know single parent family and there's yeah. a lot of pressure on you now to step up and so what in that moment kind of in that time frame like what really you know what were you going through that made that sw that switch or that change in your way of thinking you know it was a lot um i think there was just a lot of pressure on me a lot of spotlight you know just it's not just somali like i feel like muslim community everybody just talks you know what i mean you hear what happened to so and so fulan fulan mm. and so there was so much pressure uh, on myself my brother was the oldest in my family and he kind of was like a father figure to me you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, man. And, and so when he ended up getting arrested, it, it took a toll on me, myself personally, um, with my family. My mom was super, like, hyper, you know, um, worried about me. You know what I mean? So paranoid, thinking that I'm just going to end up getting arrested just like him. Mm -hmm. You know, which I did down the line. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, know. you know, it's like something that she was so worried about. And at this point in time, I'm just trying to, you know, go to school. You know, just I remember, like, um it just was so much and 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 through that pressure and just through everything all the circumstances that are happening in my life it almost felt like everybody was anticipating me for me to to fail and i did you know but i think that in those moments and that time period that was going on in my life there was just so much emotion you know because if i if i sit here and think like yeah it's because of that anticipation or it's because of that paranoia or because of that worry that everybody had for me. I don't think that was it. I think what it was internalized within myself was just so much emotion that I didn't know how to deal with. I didn't know how to navigate. You know what I mean? Growing up, I didn't really have somebody to talk to me about emotions. Even my brother, you know what I mean? He was like that authoritative figure in my life more than anything. You know, it was not like, and I talked to him about this all the time. He's like, we didn't really have deep talks as kids. You know what I mean? It was just don't do this. Don't do that. But it's because he was a kid himself. We just winging it. You know what I mean? Trying to figure out what life means. And so, like, for myself, I think that was, I just really didn't know how to navigate life. And there was just so many things being thrown at me. And it just got to a point where I was just looking for that relief. And I found it. And I found it in a way where it just was so much, it was so much relief to the point where I just kept chasing it. And it went from one drug to another, to another, to another, you know, until I ended up overdosing. You know, getting into shootouts, going to jail, having to steal because I wanted to afford this next high. Mm. And it just continued and continued and continued mm. until I had to find a way out. Mm. And, you know, alhamdulillah, what, what really led me to that was, you know, all these bad situations. But it, looking back at it, those things had to happen in order for me to rediscover myself. Mm. Of course, um, of course, it's the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like yeah. He tests us and He only tests the people that He loves. Allahu yeah. Akbar. So, you know, sometimes these tests are meant to purify us and get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, you came out of it, you know, alhamdulillah on the other end. But it, talk me through drugs because I know like, I mean, I grew up here. A lot of, I know a lot of people who use drugs. Like, you know, weed and these things are like, it's adi. Like people, mm -hmm. we don't even really consider that to be a hard drug, clearly, right? Because yeah. even in Canada right now, it's legalized, right? Yeah. Um, what was that first process with experimenting? Like, what was the first thing that kind of, you know, because I'm sure something like that, weed is very easily accessible to you guys out there. Like, Yeah, I think, I think yeah, it started with weed, you know, and I think it wasn't even the drug within itself, in within itself. I think it was more about that relief. I remember um, 
it wasn't my first time. So I was the type of friend that I used to clown my friends. You know, I started working when I was like 14 years old. Mm. My first job, I was 14. I would work summers. Then when I turned 16, I would work every day. Mm -hmm. um, by 17, I was working a full-time job wow. um, at a call center. And then I remember when I was 18, I didn't even graduate high school. So, you know, security, you have to have a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. I faked a, a transcript, a college transcript. Wow. Got a job, security. Um, and so I remember throughout my high school, I would always like clown my friends. Yo, man, what are you guys doing, man? You guys are stupid. You know, I was really that judgmental type as a kid. You know, they say be humble or be humbled, you know, and I feel like God definitely humbled me throughout my experiences. It was like something that I feel like with my friends, I just would be like, you know, like, don't do this. What are you guys doing, man? But I still kept the friendship. It wasn't like I would cut them off or anything mm -hmm. like that. And so I remember um, when I first started smoking, I hit it from my friends. I actually smoked with a dude I wasn't really that close with. Mm. You know what I mean? I was dating a girl at the time and her friend's boyfriend was who I smoked with. Mm. And so I remember me and him smoked together and I hit it from my friends. And sooner or later they ended up finding out because you can't really hide it. Mm. And once when they found out and I told them, I remember our, we all got high together and one of my close friends, he told me, he was like, I was just looking out the window and he just like, we're in a big, we're in a small car. It's like, like six of us, and my friend, um, his auntie's car that he took. It's like six in the morning. We're at this lake called Lake Calhoun, and I just remember this so vividly. I was sitting at the edge of the car in the window, and we we're packed up four in the back. And my friend just squeezed up next to me, and he tells me, he's like, hey, Abdurrahman, I don't know what's going on with you, but I just want to let you know if you're just doing this to have fun, go ahead and have fun. But if you're doing this to run away with your because they know what's going on with me. Like, they know... Like, what's my issues externally? You know, your family stuff. You know, they all know everything, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so he's like, yo, like, if you're doing this to just have fun at senior year, I get it. Go ahead, have fun. But if you're doing this, Abdurrahman, to run away from your problems, it's not going to end here. You just, like, stop right now. And I remember at that moment, I realized that there was, it was like bliss. There was nothing in my head. I wasn't thinking about anything about my life situation. My mom kicked me out that summer. So I was practically homeless, popping from couch to couch. There was a lot of stuff going on in my life. And I wasn't thinking about any of that. And after that, I smoked every day, every single day. Mm. It was soon after, three months later, I started popping pills from Xanax to Percocet to fentanyl. I dibbled and dabbled in every single drug. So hold on, but that's a quick jump. Yeah. Quick. I mean, three months. Like if you, you said you, so you started smoking weed and then within three months already jumped the pills? Yeah. Wow. Three, four months actually but it's very quick yeah but you know people say weed is a gateway drug yeah right um i don't know what you think about that but i know yeah. like even to jump from weed to pills so quickly it's and it, that's a hard jump yeah you know was it something that it was just accessible it was people around you had it i just was trying to forget you know that's the honestly like i truly believe that that's what it is is that people are just trying to forget you don't know how to deal with your emotions we were never taught that we really like the idea of of addiction is you're falling in love with something that you were never meant to love, but it comes from the want and the willingness to escape. You just don't want to face it because you never were taught how to face it. Everybody says just pray, just pray, everything will be fine. And this it's right. You're supposed to rely on Allah, but it's time and wake up. You're supposed to do the work and then have the reliance on Allah. Mm. But they never talk about the first part, you know. It's like tying your camel first. So, but on the emotional aspect, we were never taught that because our parents were never taught that and their parents were never taught mm. that. And so in order to break this cycle, we need to understand ourselves first. But how, where do we start? It starts with yourself. It starts looking in the mirror. But who's really ready to do that? At your age, with the age that we're at right now, how I've been living my life for this long, where do I begin? And that's the question that's so hard. And it looks different for every single person. Mm -hmm. It's not a one and done. I can't tell you my life experiences and expect for you to do the same because we're completely different people, different lives, different struggles. Mm -hmm. So I can't sit here and look at you and be like, hey man, you know, like this is what I went through and this is how it overcame it and this is how it's gonna work for you. Because it's so different for everybody and that's just how life is. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at it in that one lens, it will never work. You have to have that open mind, but we were never taught that. Because with, with Dean, everybody thinks it's black and white, but it's not. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They say al halal ubayin, wal haram ubayin, wa is it ubayin huma umur mushtabihat? There's a haram and halal are are are, are, are clear, yeah. but in between it, there's gray. There's gray. Mm. 
So in the, even the, the deen aspect, when we look at deen, there's gray in everything. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 it's to teach us that, that life is not one, one thing. The deen is supposed to be easy. But sometimes people with their own, you know, because of their own arrogance or ignorance or for whatever reason, it's different for every single person. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we use that to portray that because we can't see the world that way because that's how we were taught. Mm-hmm. But everybody's experience and perspective is different. Mm-hmm. So it's so hard for us to, uh, to look at the world that way because then if we do that, then we're going to have to start looking in ourselves. And it, th- that nobody wants to do that really. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I feel like recovery, when I say that I rediscovered myself in that aspect is that I used to look at the world in black and white. And there's times even still where I still do, but it's really having to look at yourself in the mirror and trying to figure out, well, what am I doing wrong? What is What do I have to improve on? And it's, it's, it's so hard to look at yourself in that light. Mm-hmm. But you have to, you know, and it's sad, but it, it, with addiction, because of how negative the world treats you, you only think about the negative things. But what it helps you do is look at those negative things and figure out how to improve them. Mm-hmm. But in a world where everything is so instant gratification based and, you know, everything is based on achievements, you never get to look at that part of yourself. And so there's people in their life where they're living their life and they never look in the mirror and they never reflect. But I feel like through my addiction, what it's given me is the the, the, the platform to reflect on myself and, and always understand that there's room for improvement. And I feel like when you're in that addiction, you just think it's only one sided because that's how the world views you. So you just continuously, continuously looking at yourself in that negative aspect. And that's why so many people get stuck in it. Mm. But if you're able to just break that matrix and understand that, hey, there's a way to overcome this. And you can use that to fuel yourself into betterment and figuring out how to better yourself. Mm. And once you break that code, it's, it never stops. You're going to always continue to better yourself because you always understand that there's room for improvement. So, so wow. It's very deep, mashallah. You now... I'm just kind of keeping with this timeline. So yeah. you start using pills. What was that feeling like? I mean, jumping from weed to pills, it's a very different high, right? It's a yeah. very different experience. Sleepy, man. So it started with Xanax. Xanax, I just wanted to forget. Mm. Xanax is an antidepressant. And I remember how quickly I fell in love with that because it was it was just, you know, you, you pop it, you don't remember anything. Mm. You, you kind of completely forget. Sometimes I end up in jail. Sometimes I end up in really sticky situations. I'd lose everything. My phone, my wallet, my keys, everything. How many times have you been arrested? I can't even count, man. Well, like, yeah, you know, alhamdulillah, like, I ain't been in jail or nothing for like more than four years now. Alhamdulillah. You know, but still, it's. Um, but it was a common occurrence, like, especially when you're in that state. You yeah. Don't know what's, I mean, you don't even know what's going on. Yeah. You don't know what's going on. You get put into predicaments, uh, been shot at, you know. Uh, my first time getting in, in a, a. seeing like pills. Like, you know, outside of that, like in terms of opioids, my friend got shot in front of me, you know? So like all of these different things kind of led to that. My friend who, my friend had a friend who had prescription to Xanax and I already knew about it. So I tried it and it was just an experiment. So then when I've seen how it affected me, then it was, I just wanted to forget, you know, with the, with the reason why I started doing Percocet and, you know, fentanyl and things like that was because with the Xanax, you forget to the point where you lose. You know, you're forgetting things, you're losing your phone, you're losing your, you know, your money, things like that. And so you, and you end up in jail sometimes too. You just do stupid things. And then because of that, you you know, you don't want to fall into those predicaments. You still want to get high. Mm. So you're trying to like, you know, weigh your losses. So you're like, okay, let me figure out a way to get high without this, that after effect. Mm. So then that the next deal was Percocet. My friend got shot in front of me. He ended up getting prescribed like 120 pills a day. So he would just give it to us sometimes. 20 Percocets a day. Not a day, a month. A month, okay. Wow. Ooh, a day. <laughs> was that an accident? Yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, nah. No, no, no. 120 a month. 120 a month is a lot. Yeah, he would pop like three a day. Wow. Three or four. But he would give us some. Okay. Yeah, he would give us some. And so that kind of opened up a whole nother world. Mm. You know, a whole nother can of worms. Because it's like, it's all the feelings that you get with Xanax times 10. Except you don't, you don't forget. Mm. You're awake the whole time. Um, very euphoric feeling. The best way to explain it is if like you were in a, you just came home, it's a cold, windy day in Toronto, and then you just go and get under like a blanket. Mm. That warm comforting. feeling, comforting feeling, mm. times 10. Wow. Yeah, just so relaxed. And so it's something that it, is, it overtakes you and it's very quickly you get addicted to it. Um, very costly. Um, and so it's why so many people end up falling into fentanyl addiction because it's cheaper. And it's such a much, much higher high, even mm. more high. So you went from Percocets. What was the first time you remember 
experimenting or even coming across fentanyl? Fentanyl, 2017, October. I don't remember when. It was in October 2017. Mm -hmm. My first time encountering, I actually overdosed. Who overdosed? I did. You overdosed the first time you used it? Yeah. Wow. I didn't even know it was fentanyl. I thought it was Percocet. So somebody so it was laced, laced yeah. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I ended up o overdosing. They kept me in the hospital for about 72 hours. Tried to break out. They, like, put me into, like, restraints, all types of crazy stuff. But I ended up, alhamdulillah, like, I, t I remember having the realization because... I took two pills, my friends took only one. And so I flatlined that day. I don't remember anything. I you, just remember- You died? That fl literally flatlined. They, they, they kept me there for 72 hours because my friends, they didn't, um, they didn't flatline. They just they woke up when, as soon as they hit them with the naloxone. And for anybody that doesn't know what naloxone means, is, um, Narcan is like meant, it's an anti-agent to help revive somebody from an overdose. Mm. And so I didn't even know what that was in that time period. But all I remember is they just tell me, yo, you flatlined, you almost died. You could have like died. And we need to keep you here because it can come back. Because when they hit you with the naloxone, it only it's for a spe specific period of time when you overdose. But you can lapse back into that overdose if it's you took a strong enough um, mm -hmm. amount of uh, fentanyl. And so I, they kept me there for 72 hours, but released all my friends. So I obviously was frustrated. I'm missing money. I don't have any of my clothes. I don't know what's going on. And so I just remember like um, I was just in the hospital. Um, and one of my friend's cousins was there and I asked him, I said, hey, where's everybody? And they're like, oh, they let them go. Why are you here? Oh, they told me to stay and watch you. I was like, okay. And so then after a little bit, like I was still woozy. And I remember coming to, and my first like instinct was just to try to leave. Mm. So he tackled me, put some green stuff into my neck. That's all I remember. And then I woke up the next morning and I was in another hospital room. Wow. Yeah, but Alhamdulillah, I had a, I had a phone. I don't know if I should say alhamdulillah or not. I had a phone, called my friends. You know, they ended up coming. And I tried to break out, got hit by a car. Yeah, like on my way, like trying to cross the street. And um, they ended up releasing me. They didn't want to release me before because they're like, you're going to lapse into it. So they made me sign a paper and they released me. I stayed away from pills for maybe a, like three weeks. But I still was using other substances, mm. you know, and then ended up going back to the pills mm. right after at that time, were you still at home, or you your mom already no, kicked, you kicked me out? Yeah, kicked me out. Yeah, so, so it was it was back on, and forth. You're on your own, running around the city, of Minneapolis. Yeah, sleeping hotel to hotel, friends to friends' house. It was like very different. And what were you doing for money? Like, how are you even affording all this stuff? Yeah, man. You know, may Allah forgive me. It was just like a lot of you know mm -hmm. crime and a lot of you know stupid stuff. You just like you you'll do anything to get to get to it. You know, and it's just mm -hmm. it's because of the withdrawals. And you know, it's crazy. I didn't even understand what the withdrawals was that time i just knew that i felt like so bad and sick felt sick yeah yeah when i was but i was just like i just thought it was like you know it was cold it was um cold time because i feel like in the summer it was just so much more abundance because mm. even the people that are doing drugs there would be people that would do it like on the weekends you know people that do it when school's out but they wouldn't do it during school so they're more of an abundance of drugs so it's like you don't have to like struggle for it but in the winter time you're struggling for it so you got to do like a lot of extracurricular activities in order to get it Mm. You know what I mean, but you wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't. It's just funny. I said extra curricular. <laughs> I was well, laughing at that. I mean, hey, bro. Like, yeah, but you know, I know what you mean. I mean, look. I, I, again, I don't want to expose anything. You don't have yeah. to say anything that's uncomfortable or you don't want to say. But like, I think it's important to paint that narrative because when people are in the depths of that addiction, they'll do anything for it. Yeah, and I think that's what frustrates so many people because yeah. you're trying to help somebody, yeah. and they'll steal from you. You're trying to help somebody, and they'll stand you up, or they'll do things that's not normal to that person because that person is not there all the way. And you just get so frustrated. You're like, what's going on with this person? I'm trying to help them. I tried. That's a, the, the number one thing I've heard for so many different people I work with is like, bro, I tried. Yeah. He won't listen to me. She won't listen to me. So like, forget it. I'm done. Because I tried already. You can only take a horse to the water mm. is what everybody loves saying, yeah, yeah. right? Um, yeah, but the thing is, you can't change anybody. It's the biggest mistake you can make. Mm. You can't guide anybody that you love. Mm. It's Allah's the will to guide somebody. Yeah. All you can do is, is help them in terms of trying to help them understand or you can help facilitate that change. Mm -hmm. What does that mean when they're ready? Meet people where they're at. The, the most common thing you hear in recovery is you have to meet people where they're at. Mm -hmm. Somebody may not be able to go all the way to that couch across the room. But maybe stand up though. Or maybe I could sit at your couch or sit on this table. I maybe can like get over there. Mm -hmm. Just meet me there. Maybe tomorrow we'll see where I can go. Maybe I'll go to that X or, or down there, but it takes time. Mm. And a lot of times people don't have that patience. A lot of times that frustration takes over, that worry, 
especially with the uh, opioid epidemic now, people are dying all the time. So when you look at your friend or your family member that's struggling with addiction, the only thing you're thinking about is, I'm going to bury this person. So you're so worried. And oftentimes we make it about ourselves because of those emotions that we're feeling, which is completely normal and natural. You know, you're just like so worked up about the emotions that you're feeling that you're like, you know, but what you have to understand is it's not about you. And it's something that I had to do with myself, right? Because I have family members that struggled with addiction, friends that struggled with addiction. I remember right when I got sober, I had to bury two of my friends. And, you know, like that amount of trauma on somebody like very early into the recovery is just so much. And all I could think about is this is going to be everybody that I know. Mm -hmm. And so it's just that drive of just wanting to help people. But you can't, it's not on your time, bro. Mm. Who are we? We're just the creation. Allah is the one that's driving the boat. We can't, we have no control over that. And so when you feel like you have control, that's when you're messing up. And that's where that frustration comes from. You have to understand this is on Allah's hands. Mm. All we can do is try our best to help facilitate and understand that this is in Allah's hands everybody's predicament right now the person i love the most allah can take them away from me in an instant and if allah does that that's the best for them and myself but that's not that's not something for me to decide mm. you know what i mean so many people i know had to put in you know like um bury them you know what i mean people that i know i love and it was so like uh i remember like first my first year was just grief bro every single month every single i lived in dallas i didn't even live in minnesota and i would go to every single month Janaza, Janaza, Janaza. Even times I'll just go visit family. I still have to go to like two, three Janazas. That year was just so much. But I remember one of the biggest concepts in my life that I had to learn and understand was Qadr. Understanding the concept of what that truly means and what does that look like. And really, that I feel like is one of the biggest concepts that you have to really grasp when it comes to addiction and recovery, especially when it comes to family members and friends, because these things are not in your hands. But it's not in the aspect of like you gotta look at it like here's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he's ordained the, one of the only things that can change that is dua mm. so you have to make dua and then on the inside it's the amal right of course Allah ordained things but you also you don't know what Allah has ordained so Allah can ordain for you to help that person but you don't know about those things so you still have to do the amal mm. and make that dua that even if Allah didn't ordain this Allah maybe he could out of, out, of, out, of, out of Qadr, Allah can change that. Mm. You don't know what's in Allah's hands. And if Allah doesn't, then that's what's the best for the situation and you have to have trust in that. So you have to make that work, do that work. Also trust in Allah's plans, right? And then make that dua. Those are the three aspects when it comes to this. You can't do one without the other. They're all connected and interconnected. And it's why we have so much frustration. We don't have that, you know, it's, it's these urges and... It's, it's such a complex thing. I can sit and talk to you about it for hours, bro. But you know, it's like, it's something that we really have to sit down and ask ourselves, what, what, what part do we play? Because everybody has a different part. Mm. So when you were running around, I mean, in the midst of that, that, that time of your life, addiction yeah. and somewhat, would you ever run into family? Would you ever see people on the streets? And like, yeah. what was the reception? Like, how did they interact with you? Man, my mom was, I feel like the person who chased me the most. My love, bless her, you know, I like, mean. She didn't understand it. She didn't even know what I was doing. Mm. I didn't open up to my mom until weeks before I got sober. Before that, I think the only thing that I told her was, uh, and this is this was out of like, she caught me, but I told her I smoked weed. And so that's what I stuck with. And my mom was so worried about my livelihood, about me not dying, that she put up with it um, for like the last year and a half. To the point where she would tell me, hey, if you're going to do what you're going to do, do it, but just do it inside the house because I was getting shot at. You know what I mean? Ended up like there would be times I remember like my mom would kick me out. And it was funny because I didn't hear the story until um, I got sober. She would kick me out and she would tell all my siblings, yo, go find him. You know? <laughs> but she would kick me out just to prove it. You know what I mean? Just, yeah, Put the yeah, foot yeah. down. Yeah. But in reality, though, she's worried every night, she checking knows. the rosters, oh. calling the hospitals. You know what I mean? So may Allah bless her soul. But I mean. she didn't know how to help me. Nobody did. Nobody understood it. You know what I mean? This is the first time it was happening in my family in that in that uh, how deep it was and so my family i mean my siblings they would be so angry at me frustrated because they see how it affect my mom and they would see how it affect them so it was like my siblings themselves uh, i mean there was i wouldn't even say there was a hate but i felt like they hated me mm. you know because they're so angry with me and so it was just like i felt like it was me against the world because nobody understood me that was a common theme throughout my addiction is i felt like nobody understood 
And I feel like that's a common theme for so many different people. Yes. You feel like nobody understands because nobody takes that time to understand because it's all about how you make them feel, which is granted underst and understood. But in that time period, you can. Uh, uh, the best way to explain it is that when you're str struggling with addiction, it's like you're in a car and you get in a crash and everybody can see the crash, but you can't see the crash. You're in the car. You may know that the car has crashed, mm -hmm. but you don't know the damage. And everybody's just shouting, yo, this car's damaged. But you don't see it. You're inside the car. And you can never truly understand it until you get out of the car. You know, you talk to everybody. You're like, yo. Or even then, you could see the damage, but you can't see how it impacted everybody else. And also, you're on an adrenaline rush. Maybe you don't feel it. Or Yeah, you know. So it's like yeah. that. the same way with your addiction is like how it impacts other people and how it looks like. It's you'll truly good. never really get it until you get sober and then you have those conversations with the person. Mm -hmm. But when you want to help that person, it really does have to be like you do have to, it, you know, in a way when you're, you know, be selfless in that point where it's like, it's about this person right now. You got to help them. You know what I mean? And, and those emotions, you can share them, right? You're, you're human. But some people are just not, you know, in that position. Sometimes it's too heavy hearted. And so like when you have a big family, like one of the things that I always like try to advise families is that, hey, maybe you're not the sibling to, to work with them at this point. You know, maybe it's another sibling. Mm. You know, maybe it's not the mom. It's the dad that can talk to the kid. Mm. So it's like really understanding what your part to play in this is. It doesn't mean that you cut them off. But it just means that... There's a there's a difference and this is it's, it's taking that hikma, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um and so for myself, I mean the biggest thing was like I mean everybody was calling my mom. Mom from family is a pretty well known family, so my mom was getting calls all the time. You know, and uh, I I remember my mom early on, she told me she was like, Yeah, nobody would tell me anything, you know, like for early on. She was like, But like after that it was just like when I because in the beginning I would hide it. But some people would see me like high, you know, some people would see my eyes red. Some people would smell it off me, but it was like I would try my best to stay out the scenes. But later on, it was got to the point where my addiction was so, you know, like I was so in depth in my addiction that you couldn't hide it. I'm 130 pounds. How could you not tell? And you're you're a big guy, so for you yeah, to be right now, yeah, 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 yeah. no, like, I'm saying, but like, even height wise, so for you to be 130 yeah. was like you were very very skinny. I was skinny, bro. You could see my ribs, my face, my cheekbones, my eyes. Literally, like wow. the, it was it was pretty bad, and so everybody could tell. But just nobody knew what it was because I was on fentanyl so early on. Nobody even knew what it was, and, and at least in the Muslim community. Mm. Um, and so it was such a big thing, man. But um, I, alhamdulillah, you know, like one thing that I do appreciate about my family was that they were willing to help me. It wasn't like they were like, what do you bah? like go leave, away, go yeah. away. It wasn't like that. It was like they were just angry and there's out of frustration. But anytime, if I wanted to go back home, I just have to go there and grab my mom's legs and be like, well, yeah, I'm sorry. Mm. And she would let me back in. Mm. You know, it's just they didn't understand what it was. But when I was truly willing and I had to make that choice myself, and I told my family, oh, yeah, I, like, I want to change. This is what's going on in my life. Everybody was there, full support. Mm. You know what I mean? And I love my family. They were they were willing to be there I'm beside not. me. And it was, it was just that I had to let them in. And so it's like, it's not the blame on the family or nothing like that. It's not the blame on the addict, but there is that accountability aspect when you're struggling with addiction that you have to let your family in and help them understand. And even then on the family side, you have to also, you know, be willing to understand, be willing to listen, understanding that maybe you might not understand everything, but what can you understand? Mm -hmm. What can you take accountability for? Because it's very interconnected. Mm -hmm. um, but Alhamdulillah, like, yeah, you know, like there would be t people talking on the outside, but you know, that's just part of how it goes, man. Mm. I lost a lot of friends, I lost a lot of, you know, like ties with even family and stuff like that, hearing different things. But it's really like taking that accountability and really learning how to let go of things when you do get sober. Mm. I, I asked about how your family interpreted your uh, addiction or how they saw you and viewed you because um, you made a documentary, Mashallah yeah. Tabarakallah, which we can talk about because I think it's a very powerful film. Yeah. And one scene in that documentary, and it's it's a very scary thing to watch. It's was basically you kind of like in the midst of like you An know, overdose. overdosing, like you were yeah. right about to overdose. I, even watching it, I like I felt sick to my stomach, man. Even mm -hmm. just seeing like what was happening. Can you take us back to that moment? Like, what do you remember them from that? You video? know, what's crazy is that video was taken on the day of my first overdose. But that was the first. Yeah, that's my friend. My wow. friend took a video of it. My friend Khalid, he took a video. He didn't have no clue that we were overdosing though. We used to do this thing when we would get high. You know what I mean? And intoxicated. We take videos of each other. Hey, look at what you were up to last night. You know, like mm. just some stupid stuff like that. But um, he had no clue that we were like overdosing or nothing. It wasn't until I fell into the floor and everybody seen all my friends kind of laid out that he was like, damn, these guys are dying. And so then he called 911. But he didn't know that in the beginning. You know, how could you? 
you have no background in this you know this is something that's new to us as a phenomenon so like i think like um it was it was it was man i have no remem- i have no memory all i remember was taking the pill and as soon as i took that pill that was it i just woke up i remember literally like having moments of just me waking up and i remember they ripping my my um shirt. my shirt my friend Allah he, he died a few years ago but i remember he was right next to me and um i just remember him waking up fighting the the nurses and then i just remember waking up going back to sleep and then i woke up again and then i'm in the hospital you know but i, I remember they they had me in the gurney at that moment when i woke up that's the only memory i have it's very scary I mean, yeah, even seeing you seeing like you, you know, you're out of it, like you're drooling. Like I've, I've, I've overdosed a few times, and I remember all of those times. I didn't, I don't even know how I survived. And those moments, I remember like so vividly. Like I thought I was gonna die, like because, because in, in the moments you just wake up, like you know. And I remember one time, I remember I was in a paramedics thing, and they put the thing over me, and I just woke up. I was so scared. Bro. You thought it was halal. It was game over. Bro, I don't know what was Damn. going on. You know that one mo- uh, movie, uh, Hassan? <laughs> no, you know what I'm talking about? No, what is that? Man, this, so there's this, there's this old movie way back where there's this guy, he went, fell asleep listening to music. Okay. And Oh, it's like an ad or something. No, it was, a, it was a short movie, man. Oh, okay. It was a short movie, like maybe 10 minutes you can find it. Where uh, And the guy, he basically dies in his dream uh, listening to music. Oh, yes, and he yes. sees himself. because it's, it's in Arabic. I think so, yeah. I think so, yeah. And yeah. Islamically, you know, like there's that belief. But um, when, when somebody dies, you can see and hear everything, mm. right? And so, bro, I remember I thought it was it for me because I they put the they put the rag over my head, oh, like yeah, the sheets. Allah. And I remember just waking up and I just started reading Ayatul Kursi because I was so scared. Wow. I thought I was... <laughs> I was thought this guy was <laughs> medical <laughs> moat. Just yeah, <laughs> bro, I don't know what it was. Wow. But, you know, so there's different experiences like that, man, where I could just think back and look back on, you know, where... But alhamdulillah, during those moments, every single time, what I do appreciate because of that background in Dean is I always would pray and I always make dua during these different moments where I was in jail, I just got shot at, I would wake up in the you know, hospital, overdose. Alhamdulillah, those moments... I would really try my best to connect to faith, you know, try to like make dua, you know. And so, alhamdulillah, those moments really is what I feel like define my journey. And even when I was truly willing to change, I would pray, you know, and that prayer was what helped me and and, and also seeking that help. You can't do one or the other. You know, it's like, of course, always pray. But also, after you pray, you seek. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, it's that ayat, it's that ayat. It's the, you, know, yeah. you know, and so you, you have to hear that patience and, and that prayer. And you also, you look, you yeah. look for the, you know, the help. And so with me, it was my family. I look for mentorship. You know what I mean? And, and if, if I sit here and talk to you about my entire story of how that happened, uh, we'd probably be here for another couple of hours. But I'll yeah. tell you, man, you know, like it's when you, Wallahi, put that trust in Allah and you try to make that, you know, you make that decision that I'm going to make a difference in whatever it may be. Allah will open doors. Wallahi, was it? When you take Allah, yajallahu makhraja, wa yirzukhu min haythu la yahtasib. That he will, he will open doors for you and you, you don't even know where it's going to come from. You don't even, it's going to come from this roof. You have no clue. Mm. And it's so beautiful in a way where it's like when you find that recovery and, and you try to make that change, Allah will open up ways for you and doors for you to change in ways that you never would have expected. Bro, I had never been to Dallas, Texas. I don't know how I entered there. I don't know where I where it came from. Mm. I don't know how I ent- entered into Harlem. I don't know where all of these different pieces into my life. I had no clue. Mm. Allah just placed people in my life. And for the first couple of months, trust me, I was alone. It was just me and my grandma. And it's not my mom's mom. It's my mom's auntie. I met her maybe three times in my life before that. Mm. You know what I mean? It speaks mostly just Somali. Mm. You know what I mean? And well, I let's, just, let's get to that. Hold on. We jumped yeah. a lot because I want to just ask you, like, what was the rock bottom that led you to even say, you know what? This is the time I'm going to take my recovery seriously. Like, what what, what was that moment when you realized I have to change? Bro, it was Ramadan. So I went to jail right before then. And that was the first time I started praying in April 21st, 2019. I think my first day or my second day, I started praying in there. I was only in jail for like two weeks, two, three weeks. I was supposed to do a month and they gave me um, credit because I was in jail already mm. for the same case. Mm. And so I was in there for two weeks, but alhamdulillah, I got out two days before Ramadan. Ramadan was a Monday that, that, that year. I got out on Saturday. So it was May 3rd, Ramadan was May 5th. Um, 
throughout that time period, bro, I was praying for Allah to remove this because it was my first time going through se severe withdrawals. Like, no drugs to compliment or nothing like that. Mm. I was just going through straight, strict withdrawals. Mm. And I remember just it was so bad. And, bro, it was just crazy because I just started seeing so many different... Bro, I was in jail with a bunch of old people. You know what I mean? These dudes talking about how they're doing time is so easy. You know, and... um it wasn't even just that aspect. It was just the, I was trying to change already before that. I remember in January, I just had a really bad experience um, in January 2019. And throughout that, from there until June, I just kept trying to change. And every time I just kept co falling back. And alhamdulillah, what I would do is I would try to figure out what it was. Why do I keep falling back into this drugs? Your own trigger is trying to figure yeah. out. Yeah, first it. I blamed my environment. Then I blamed my friends. You know, then I was like, it's not, I'm praying. It's, it's, it's uh, I'm not praying. So I tried praying. I even went to a madrasa. This guy, Sheikh Abdurrahman Susi, I went to his class, it was on 38th. I used to walk there, bro. And it was on 38th and Hiawatha or 36th and Hiawatha, something like that. It was like 10 blocks away from my house. I would walk there and it didn't work. I still was doing drugs friend still was doing drugs uh, you know and, and when I started praying and I and I opened up to my family and then I, I I told my family what was going on and I was like it came to a point where first I was trying to change where I was and then I was like you have to leave so I left and then after I left all those doors opened so you said I need to leave Minnesota yeah I have to leave you need I to leave I was gone for like nine months what was the what was the first place you went to New York I was in New York for three months and those three months were just like solitude. I was just by myself. That was just straight, like, because you're probably going through crazy withdrawal at that time yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I relapsed. I relapsed as soon as I got out of jail. Right. Yeah, yeah I relapsed, yeah. man. You know, alhamdulillah, the thing is, though, is like during that time period, was, even during Ramadan, I was relapsing, still praying. Even I would try to fast. And how I would do is like, I would fast and then I would wait till iftar and then I'd, I'd end up going back to it. You know, may Allah forgive me, man, but it was it was a process. Bro, you were trying your best. It man. was a process, you know, and it was going less and less as time went on. Mashallah. You know, and I remember there was even a time I almost got killed. You know, I was in street life, and dude ended up rolling up on me. I almost got killed in front of my house. Hid in the back, went through the alley, went in through the side of my house. I remember telling everybody get down. My mom was so scared. Everybody thinking that you know the house about to get shot up. Alhamdulillah, it didn't. Um, my mom didn't let me leave. It was twenty seventh night. Mom did not let me leave. I was with my friend. Um, and I remember we both got high because we still had the pills on us. And because I couldn't uh, go to the masjid, my mom wouldn't let me leave. I prayed. I was high as hell. Prayed. But I remember the emotion that I was feeling of how so stuck I was and just praying. And it wasn't until a week later, I think I told her. I didn't tell my mom during Ramadan. I told my mom like a week after I eat. I was like, oh, yeah, this is what's going on with me. And I need to leave. Boom, boom, I'm gone. So she automatically was like... That, was that quick. Wow. But it, I, I truly believe if it wasn't for those prayers and for my mother's prayers and for that willingness, I don't know where I would be because I didn't even know about all of these different avenues that were opened up for me. But Allah just made it possible. And then you, you go to New York. This yeah. is where you're... It's not even your grandmother you're saying. It's, it's my mom's sister. That's my grandma, though. Your gra yeah, my right, right, right. My mom's mom's sister. Right, My right. father, yeah. And so right. she, she opened those doors for me. Mm. You know what I mean? It was very helpful to me. Um, you know, and it was, it, was, it was a lot of solitude, but it, that the solitude is fortitude. You got to separate to elevate. Mm. And during that time period, I had a lot of self-reflection. I started thinking about so many different things. And it helped me you know, fortify who I was and what I wanted to do with my life. You know, and the, the, in, in those moments is when I realized I need to make a difference in my community. I had a lot of friends that were struggling with addiction and it didn't really solidify until a really close friend of mine had died, you know, in September. And then that's when we started doing the work. I'll be going back to Minnesota like almost every month. So how did you end up in Dallas? I got accepted to a school called Cullen while I was in New York. I okay. applied months before well, I was still struggling with addiction. My you, sister, father, was to going Qalam. to school. Right. Yeah, my sister was going to the school. And Sheikh Mikael Smith, may Allah bless him, mm. he was in town for his book uh, with, um, with the heart and mind. Yes. And he wrote this book. And I remember, I don't know this dude from a can of paint. Mm. And my sister just told me to go. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to go just to make her happy, right? Mm. It's my older sister. She's been gone. She's in school. I'm just trying to make her happy. So I go. I go sit in the furthermost corner in the masjid because I'm not trying to be seen by nobody. I have my mama down. But dude just keeps calling on me. <laughs> what do you mean? Like he's asking questions to the crowd. He's like, hey, you. 
<laughs> You're all the way in the back. I'm all the way in the back, but I don't know why he keeps calling me. So I remember I'm texting my sister Zahra, like, hey, you know what's, um, you know, this guy know us? Does he think like, does he know that we're related to Father or something like that? Uh -huh. So then at the end, we go up to him. He's like, yo, like, how did you know? <laughs> what that you we're... on? Like, why you keep calling me out? Yeah, was, <laughs> it, was it because of my my sister? Uh -huh. He's like, what? Your father was a brother? <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't even, he didn't even know. No clue. Subhan but his Allah. charisma and character, it took. I took such a liking to it that when my sister asked me, I said, okay. I just applied. But I had no intention of going or nothing. Mm. Months later, I'm in New York, already trying to make this change in my life. And boom, I get an email. Hey, you know, we're doing an interview. So I just do the interview to make my sister happy. But I have no clue that I'm going to get accepted. A, couple, a month later, July, I'm in this uh, conference called BMPC uh, with Sister uh, Camila Rashad, who also had a very uh, impact, a big impact on my life and my recovery journey. But this, this, during this time, I don't know any of them. I go there. I meet a brother named Tabari Zahir, who has an organization called the Tabari Foundation. He was incarcerated for like 12 years, opened up an organization, does a lot of work in the Muslim community around addiction, recovery, reentry, works with people, helps them, you know, with their life. And so I remember sitting and listening to him. And also, I got the pleasure to meet uh, Brother Yusuf Salam. He was Yo, part wow. of the From Central the Park Five. Central Park Five. And wow. all of this is just about, you know, redemption. Yes. Brothers that have redeemed and, and came out of their life. And so this is just like, I feel like the whole time when they're talking, they're talking to me. Only you. And I, I Yeah, and I ended up speaking to them. And alhamdulillah, like, during those moments, I remember, I was just like, yo, I, got, I really got to change my life. It's possible. It's possible. These guys did it. I can do it. Even though we have completely different stories. Mm -hmm. But it's just the idea of, like, where they put themselves in their life. And so I remember that time I took a... Whereas in Mal Malvern, Pennsylvania, I took a Greyhound bus from Malvern, Pennsylvania to back to New York, and I made a du'a because I had the choice to go back to Minnesota. At this point, my sister's telling me, yo, listen, even if you don't get accepted, it's still good for you to come, you know? And she had to do her, um, her, her back her lease the next month. And so I remember she telling me that, oh, I could go back to Minnesota. And so I made a du'a on that bus, oh Allah, whatever's good for me, I like opened the door. That was a Monday I came back. Thursday it was July 25th. That day, I remember I had a um, interview with Nordstrom Rack because over there it's sixteen, fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage. <laughs> Good money to me. <laughs> Trying to get time. paid, hell yeah. So I got, I had a, um, I had a um, interview with them, mm -hmm. and so I remember I took the interview. I used to take the six train back from uh, Manhattan to Harlem, and so I remember I took, did the interview, and then on my way back from that interview, I was on the uh, six train, and I remember I used to just download Netflix and just watch it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, bro, but I got an email. Well, look, I got I got an email while I was on the train mm. saying I got accepted. I'm like, yo, this is like three days after I made the door. <sighs> then um, I'm there. Somehow, some way, bro, the door closes for New York. I can't get the job. Nordstrom, they uh, they uh, denied me for the interview. Like they said, yo, mm. boom, bro, I'm like you're not getting accepted. Mm. A couple of other places I applied to, same thing. So I can't work there. I don't know what my plan was. So I just, after Eid, it was August 11th that day. The next day, the 12th, I went back to Minnesota. Mm. I go back to Minnesota. I remember I visited a couple of my friends. They're on the same thing. A couple of days later, a family friend of mine got killed. So I'm like, yo, what am I doing? During this time period, they also, what? They, they, the, the, I seen how much they charged. It was a good amount of money. I said, yo, what can I do? I can't go here, you know? And You're so I was- the column, yeah, the yeah, seminary, they, they, right? they pay money. You have yeah, to pay yes, money, yes, right? Yes, yes. So I remember, um, my, I was like, I'm not going here. My sister's like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not relying on my family. To my family can't pay that money. My sister's like, no, don't worry. Allah will make a way. Allah will make a way. Just apply for the scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I did. But I, I had no idea that any, so then I keep, I go back, go to Minnesota. While I'm there, my sister, mind you, she had to sign her lease August 1st. She ended up signing her lease. So she's like, yo, if you're not coming, you're not coming. I had to sign my lease. So she had girl roommates. I can't live with her. Mm -hmm. she, originally, what she wanted to do, get our own apartment. So then boom, I go to Minnesota. While I'm in Minnesota, three days before my sister leaves, I get it, I got, I got accepted for the scholarship. Oh, you got the scholarship. Yeah, I got the scholarship. <sighs> but when I got the scholarship, now what? What's another issue? No, you don't have accommodations. Uh, where am I supposed to live? Yeah. So then my sister calls a few people. Bro, I remember packing my bags, having no clue where I was gonna sleep. My sister just said, don't worry. I have trust in Allah, you'll, you'll get there. We get there, bro. Uh, there was a brother that I ended up uh, staying, sleeping on his couch. And he said, I'm going to help you find a place. Mm -hmm. First day, I met a brother who, you know, is still a good friend of mine to this day. We were the only two 
or one of the three black people in the class. Mm. He just said, yeah, I have a feeling we're going to be friends. <laughs> There's some odds here. It's probably in our favor. Alhamdulillah, him and another brother, there was, a, there was another dude that I was supposed to live with. Uh. That didn't work out. And I remember the day that I got the text message, I was at the brother's name's hottest house that I was uh, crashing at his couch. There was another brother across from me named Akram, Bayumi. He lives in Seattle. He's the imam of uh, Maif or Maps. Another Ma Mesha, anyways, over there. He seen me, and this guy doesn't know me from Canopy. He just looks at me, he's like, "Yo, bro, what's going on with you?" He just sounds like, looks like you, you're having a bad day. And I don't know what compelled me to tell him my situation, but I did. He said, "Yo, I have other roommates. Let me talk to them. I'll let you know." Guess who's his roommate? My my classmate, the other dude that's in my class. So I ended up staying with them. But Alhamdulillah, these brothers were supporting me. You know, like were there for me, and um, that that was that was it. Man. Allah and, just open up all these. Yeah, doors, man, bro. and 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 all these people that were placed in those spaces were people that helped me with my recovery with with my recovery journey. Everybody just really helped me throughout that time. And it's really, you know, recovery cannot happen without community. 100%. You know what I mean? It takes a village. And so throughout that time period, it's what really helped me, you know, become who I was. Throughout that time, I was dealing with grief. I was dealing with, you know, loss. I was dealing with, you know, self-doubt, imposter syndrome, so many different things in my life, you know, survivor's guilt. And I, I truly believe that Allah placed these people in my life because Allah I used God. to ask so much, like, Allah, I'm alone. I don't have no friends. All my friends are doing this. I don't know who I'm, I'm going to rely on, what I'm going to do. And Allah placed those people in my life. I, you know, and it was, it's something that you have to rely on Allah for Allah to do that for you. You know what I mean? And of course, like, as you grow, you're not going to, they're not going to check in with you as much because now you're, you're growing, you're good, right? But during that first year where I really needed that stability, Allah gave, provided it for me to the point where now I, I it's like, now it's, it's not like that anymore where, you know, I, I'm relying on that, you know, emotional stability because Allah placed people in my life to help me grow it. To, for that sustainability to happen, you know, but it's something that you have to rely on a lot and then also look for it. And Allah oh, okay. will place it in your life. So how long were you in Dallas? How long did you study at Qalam? It was, uh, it was a year program, but COVID happened. Oh, right. And I remember throughout that whole year, I was so worried. When am I going to go back? When am I going to go back? And I remember having so many conversations with Sheikh Mikhail. I don't know if I'm ready. How am I going to know I'm ready? He's like, Allah will just let you know when you're ready. And I didn't know if I was ready to go back to Minnesota until I was forced to. Because of COVID. Mm. <laughs> and I come back. And then that's when the work really began. You know, and then alhamdulillah, things just started picking up. So now you arrive in Minnesota. You're, you're clean for the first time in yeah. a while. You have this new renewed iman. Your, your, your head is clear. You're focused. Yeah. What, is, what is it you want to do when you're out there? Like, what is the purpose of you being back home? Like, what did you see as your mission now that you're back home? To help my community when it comes to, like, addiction and, 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 and recovery. And so from that time period, I was just really just driven to, to, to try to make a difference in any way I can. And so it was just figuring out different avenues to do that. I didn't even have a clue what a nonprofit was. I didn't know what a 501c3 was, any of those things. You know what I mean? I didn't have no background in that. And so it was just really just going with the, rolling with the resistance, going with the flow and just trying to figure it out. And Allah opened those pathways for you. You know, you just have to keep going and keep going and keep trying. And Alhamdulillah, you know, I, I'm growing and learning as, you know, the life, you just wing it, bro. Mm. You know what I mean? The, the best thing that I've been told and what, what helps me, uh, you know, roll with resistance is that, as my brother told me, he's like, yo, Abdul Rahman, I think it was when I was 22, he said, you know how to be 22. So what do you mean? I just turned 22. He's like, he's like, no, so you don't, but you know how to be 21, right? Yeah. He's like, do you know how to be 23? No, because I'm not 23 yet. He's like, so exactly every year, we're just winging it. So don't worry too much on it. Just go with the flow. Just, what you look at is your past, but don't worry about the future because all we are in life is we're just winging it. And you know, and so you have that trust in Allah and you have to act. You can't just be worried, you know, because then you're worried to too much to the point where you don't act, then you won't get anything done. Mm -hmm. So you just keep working. You keep trying. You have that faith in Allah and Allah will, he'll pave it out for you. So now you, amazing, but you, you arrived back in Minnesota, pandemic time. I know, I mean, I know a little bit of the story, so I fill in some of the blanks. Like you started doing a lot of the community work that was, you know, in terms of helping elders, in terms of giving back, because it was obviously a very difficult time. Yeah. You know, a lot of things were very di challenging for a lot of community members in the city yeah. at that time. So you take an active leadership role in a lot of that work. Yeah. And um, the first time you came on my radar was when I saw the Confident Muslim Award. Yeah. So... How did that come about? Because now you had been doing this work for a little bit. You, you've obviously created your organization. The organization is called Generation, Generation Hope. Hope. Yeah. And Generation Hope works towards helping people in mm -hmm. recovery and helping, mm -hmm. especially, you know, breaking down that stigma and yeah, providing that support. Addiction, yeah. Right. So you got on the radar of a lot of people, including, I guess, Yaqeen and, and Sheikh Omar Suleiman. Uh, yeah. w when did you get wind of the fact that there was, you know, they wanted to present you with this type of award? Well, it was during Ramadan. I had no clue. Um, 
I guess like so earlier that year when brother Shul Yusuf Salam, brother Yusuf Salam, um, got the uh, award. I was there. Okay, they had a dinner because my sister used to work. For yes, them. yes. And so I met them momentarily, and I ended up leaving the next day. Uh, but I didn't. I I've, I've knew of Sheikh um, Umar Salaman because my sister used to work with him, mm-hmm. and so I've met I've, I've I've met him a few times at like Valley Ranch, but I never really like had a conversation with him, mm. you know per se. Just like Salam, how are you doing? Mm. Um, and so I didn't really know like even how that happened until my sister told me that there was that day that I that I went there, that one of the sisters from over there just asked, hey, you know what's this guy's story? She's like, oh, that's my brother. You know, he does work in the community, this and that. And she told him about his story, uh, like what I do. And then after that, she followed my social media and got to see like a glimpse of it. And so then that's how the, that's how it happened. It just, I guess. So they just threw your name in the hat. What, what, you got a message or an email or something. Somebody told you you won an award? Yeah, they re- no, they reached out to me. Oh, they, they reached out to yeah, you? Yeah, they reached out to me. Okay. And then they were like, hey, I don't think it was an award. It was just like a confident Muslim. Right. Like they get a, they give one award a year, but then they did a segment with me. Mm. And so they asked me to do it, and I obliged. I thought it was great. I was also writing a book at that time called From Addict to Advocate. And so it just arrived at the perfect time. And so then I ended up going there, and um, alhamdulillah, I got to share my story. But it was so scary. Mm. I never spoke in front of that many people in my entire life. Mm. Um, very emotional. Um, and uh, alhamdulillah, you know, opened a lot of doors. And um, I feel like it was very beneficial, you know, um, for myself and for other people and, and for the mission, really. Like, it it, it it got that story out to so many different people. I, I, my stepdad just literally told me the other day that he was picking up, um, you know, a kid. And he was picking him up all the way from a city called Duluth. He was in a treatment center. And he was taking him to a clinic in Minneapolis. And when he picked him up, the guy was watching one of that video, that Yaqeen video. Wow. And he's like, do you know that's my son? And the guy was just like started hugging him and stuff. And you told me this like three days ago, maybe. But it was it was very like, um, you know, heartwarming and touching to to hear something like that because you never know, you know, how you're gonna inspire people until you just make that act of trying to do that work. You can never underestimate that power of impact and, and inspiration. You just have to just keep trying. But you know that's that's the thing about it is like. You know, it's, it's all in Allah's hands at the end of the day, and, and you don't know how much people will relate to you until you talk about it. Mm-hmm. Bro, I could have a brother that died, you could have a brother that died, but if I n- never talk to you about it, you'll never relate to me. Mm-hmm. You probably look at me and be like, yo, this guy doesn't get it. Mm-hmm. But if I tell you, then you can, you'll can you be open to telling me. So it's the whole idea is that we can't keep having this, you know, better than thou, Muslim community, hiding, shame. You know, it's the only way that we can really understand each other and help each other. Is if we talk about it. I mean, you know, hearing you speak that day, I mean, I watched the video. Um, I heard, I watched the video attentively because I, you know, I also struggled with addiction for many yeah. years, you know, growing up. I still struggle with addiction. It's not something that, you know, just goes away overnight. Like I have an addic- addictive personality. People, you know, I would call it that. So I resonated with your video a lot and I resonated with yeah. your message and I knew the city you're coming from. And so automatically I'm like, oh, this is my guy. Like, yeah. this is my brother. Like, on a different level, like, I could relate to you maybe in, in ways the people hearing you in that day maybe didn't appreciate, you yeah. know, but there's a lot of people who saw you that day mm-hmm. and thought, wow, like this is a very, very, very brave brother to come out and say this and make yourself vulnerable and tell people about your, your demons, these dark secrets that we don't want to share with people. We don't want to tell people we've struggled. We don't want to tell people yeah. we failed. But to see you do that and subhanAllah, in that moment of humility, you've opened the doors for so many people to now have these conversations, to talk about this work. Well, like, I love you, brother. I love the I fact love that, you, yeah, that what you're doing is so unique and powerful because, again, these conversations don't happen often, you know, in our community, in the Muslim community, outside of even the Muslim community. People don't talk about addiction. They don't talk about these type of work. Yeah. So the fact that you've been able to do it and, and do it in such a way that now you have an, an organization which everyone should support in, every, in any capacity we can, Generation Hope, um, and then your documentary as well, which again should be screened everywhere. I yeah. think this is a film that people really need to see because it's 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 hard to accept, but it's truth, and it's not sugarcoating the reality. And it's if we're going to address these problems, we need to be real and we need to make ourselves vulnerable, like you have. And I think a lot of us can take lead from what you've done. So, what's next for Abdurrahman? I know obviously there's so many things that you know you'd love to accomplish now, but I just feel like the the world is wide open for you. Like it feels like you know. From where you came from till now, it's like 
I don't know what 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 can't you do to come over addiction and to have this public platform. It's like I, I mean, I just think that you could really do anything at this point. Subhanallah. Yeah. First and foremost, I want to thank you. Like, you know, I know we've had conversations before, but yeah, it's a heavy subject, bro. Bro, bro now, like I, I watched you growing up. You know what I mean? Like you're a role model to me. <laughs> and I mean that in the most like, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, but you know, just hearing that from you, mm. it's so affirming to me. And I feel like it would be so affirming to so many other people because, of course, like, bro, this is something that you've struggled with and you don't even talk to in depth. Yeah. But I, imagine, like, how I would have heard that maybe a few years ago. Spot like, on. man, you don't even know how, what that could do for somebody. Yeah. Because there's so many people that look up to you. Mm. You know what I'm saying? There's so many people that, like, and that's the thing about these conversations and, and understanding that, bro, you're just human. Mm. It's just like everybody else. Mm. And we all have the pressures that deal with us, but the only way for us to overcome it is this that we share it so i just want to honor you in that aspect of bro like thank you for speaking about that because mm -hmm. it's so impactful mm -hmm. you don't know who that would touch we don't know who we touch bro yes, until we speak about it Allah. you know what i'm saying and so may allah bless you on that but I mean, I mean. Uh, you know just working bro taking it day by day i'm really just trying to focus on myself right now uh, to make sure that i don't burn out you know um but you know we're working on opening up a drop-in center you know um and so that's going to right be right in the hood too yeah. right in cedar yeah yeah and so the whole idea of that is to work with people that you know are struggling with addiction struggling with homelessness and really meet them where they're at meet them connected to resources i never knew what suboxone methadone narcan none of those things were and so the idea of the space is to be a placeholder for individuals to get them those that connection through resources mm. um i'm also writing like an anthology book um that's like it, it's the whole idea of it is called it takes a village. Growth can't happen without community. Mm -hmm. And so really just talking about, um, you know, addiction and a lens, uh, you know, and, and, and recovery and really ha talking about the idea of individualism and how, how much it's impacted the Muslim community mm. and why it's so hard for people to recover in Muslim communities nowadays. Mm. Um, and so it's in the process, you know, but inshallah, uh, you know, we'll get it done soon. But, um, you know, like just working, man, we a lot of th different things that we're working on. But inshallah, um, you know, we'll get there. And I think everyone should check out your poetry as well. Yeah, you're, you're a dope poet, man. And bro, you the best. And look, well, look, Come you on, got man. something I don't got. He got that voice, <laughs> a lot, nah, bro. <laughs> he got that raspy, that like, uh, you know, yeah. like that. And he got the looks too much. Can, can I say something real quick? Uh, you can have every title, every big <laughs> shot degree, but you still can't explain. And if me. <laughs> Come on, man. Allah, that's embarrassing. I just show you what I'm saying. Nah, bro, nah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Allah about it. You know, just like, you know, you're saying that, like, you yeah. know, we don't know the impact we have. Yeah. You know, SubhanAllah. I don't know. Uh, you know, sometimes you just do things. And now years later, hearing you say that, you know, you bro, watch you watch my poetry and stuff, yeah, like, it's bro, crazy. 12, 12, 11, 12 years old. I swear to God, bro. I, I think I showed it some the Facebook wall, man, from 2011, 2010, man. As a kid, <laughs> I'm just showing, you know, like, all the poetry and stuff so wow. man, 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 my love bless you but i mean i mean but yeah man i've been writing poetry man I, I had a writer's block over the summer but i've been writing still like you know um, how can people get your books how can people find your, your work you can find us on generation hope org. um so we sell the books through that website you can find us on amazon you can find us uh you know i i, I did a book tour last year soon but we're going to be selling some of the books oh the books ain't going nowhere they ain't, they ain't yeah, going nowhere yeah, so man. so you can check us on the socials yeah anybody that wants a, a book you know what i mean um but uh, yeah, it's all over the social media. Inshallah, I'm trying to still continue writing poetry. You got to, bro. You know what I mean? I love, I love poetry. Um, you know, I can, I can show, I can share some of the poetry right now. If you Could want. you? Yeah. Could you share one poem for us, please? Yeah, you know, because I, 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 I really do want people to hear it, and I think it, you, your poetry, I think, is so beautiful. It comes from such a, a, a pure place. Because I can hear the influence. I can hear the uh you know the 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 work that you're doing being put into your poetry so i really do feel like it's a very valuable voice that i'd love to share with the, with the community inshallah so inshallah, please you. inshallah you broke me you broke me in ways i can't even begin to explain you took everything from me and left me with nothing but pain you made me hate myself in more ways that i learn every day but the worst thing about it is that no matter how much i run away from you within me you left a stain mm. I'm tainted, I'm ruined, you made me so useless. As I relearn of myself and our love, you abused it. You took my health too and, our, and my mind, you subdued it. Time after time, you took my mind and confused it. I burn and I've crashed, I'm less stuck in the past. As I look back into time, I regret all the time that has passed. 
old peers in six gigs, in old peers in six gears, starting families and careers, while I'm finding myself trying to overcome my own fears. Things I should have done when I was young and I was reckless, detrimental to my mental. Regret has me depressed them. As I grow older and older, I've come to learn how much I'm damaged. Worst of all was this fall. I learned how much you left me abandoned. We were a toxic couple, us two. Either we were in love or abused. The hurt never comes first. When you're oblivious, it'll randomly come to you. But it leaves you wanting more because it's the only thing that you know. To the point that it still comes to your mind long after you've learned to let it go. Every time you come back together, you crash even harder than in the past. But so much emotional ties and twisted lies, you tell yourself it'll be better than the last. I'm smarter this time. I know my limits, I'm fine. I know what happened to others, but I'll be different this time. We're toxic and I know it. Sometimes I love it, sometimes I don't. Hard for me to love you when every promise you made you broke. I gave you all of me, you took everything, even my hope. I thought we were something special, I resent you, and truly I hate you the most. How easy was it for our love to turn into hate? I feel so stuck in between. Especially when I think about our past, all the history and memories. Hard for me to let go, especially after all the things you've done for me. Even when it hurts the most, the truth is you gave me the closest thing to peace. You were my home away from home. I came to you when things were rough. For me, you'd bust it down when I would frown. You made me happy when things were tough. I'd play around when I was down, man. I thought you were my forever. Even when you almost killed me, I didn't even think I should get it together. Cause you gave me an escape from all the pain and made me feel good in ways I can't even explain. You made me feel warm and relaxed. My soul was trapped. I felt so sick when you were away. For you, I'd rob and I'd steal anything to cop a feel. Hard for me to find someone else like you. And without you, it's hard to heal. Every time I try to leave, I feel like I lose a part of me. You never leave my thoughts and always end up right in front of me. Either you pop up on my feed or you see me, you try to tease. I try to stick to my decision, motive-driven, but you always know how to keep me pleased. You only stay for a moment, hard to keep you for any longer. And it's like you play the sick game to keep my feelings growing fonder. To the point that I'll do anything to be with you, and then you stay when you see I'm loyal. But all it takes is hard times when I run out of lines for our love to easily spoil. Crazy thing is I heard things about you, but I always thought that I could handle you. I thought that I was different, that I could hit it without having to be down with you. But you, you're different. I learned this lesson, and now you got me stressing. You kept me guessing, took all my blessings, and now my life has become bound to your presence. And even though I've left, I know you're still my test. You still come to me in all my dreams. And although you're gone, please don't respond as I write this letter to my first love. My DOC, drug of choice. <sighs> Bro, <laughs> yeah. that's heavy. That's heavy, man. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. May Allah bless you, my brother. Thank you. I mean, that smile, bless you, you too, know, man. this is beautiful, bro, to see what you've overcome. Um, I really see the Tyrese in your smile, by the way. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you guys call me Tyrese, man. You funny. They be calling this guy Tyrese. <laughs> and now I see the smile. And I just see them right now. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's they why they call you Tyrese. Boy, that's what they say. <laughs> brother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. I mean. May Allah azza wa jal protect you. I mean. Um, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow the work you're doing to be something which benefits many, many people. I mean, people all of us. All around the world. All of us. I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow the work that you're doing to be a sadaqa jariya for you, for your family, for your teachers, for everyone who's invested time and energy into you and your mm -hmm. recovery. Um, and I just ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you from any fitna, from trials, from all the tribulations that are outside of the world now. We just ask you and the viewers, everyone watching, to make dua from my, from my brother, Abdul Rahman. And he's my brother. I'm it's letting y'all know. He's my brother. Anybody got a problem with Abdul Rahman, they got a problem with me. I'm putting it out Better there. Take it out. I'm, put, I'm, put, I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out there because the work our brother is doing is so valuable. I don't want anyone to get it twisted. He's, mashallah, tabarakallah. He's our guy. And we all got to support him. We all got to protect him and make sure that, inshallah, the message gets out to those masses. Because the work you're doing is bigger than you, Haqi. It's, well, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than all of us. Because we're really, you're really changing and saving lives. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to keep you on a straight path and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all your good deeds. And I, I, I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to bless you and, and to um, allow this work to be something that we can all continue to share, inshallah. And, and uh, just quickly before we go, best place to find you online where, I mean, obviously Generation Hope. Yeah, Generation Hope, MN. MN, um, yeah. Uh, dot org. You can find us on Instagram. Uh, my name is Abdurrahman. Uh, you can not give you the, so they can put it right we'll, there. We'll throw it right like there. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Generation Hope, MN. 
Uh, you can find us on there as well. On YouTube as well. Ge- yep, on YouTube, Generation Hope MN. Everywhere. Check it out. Yeah. Share it with your friends and family. Tell your community. Support this initiative. Donate, please. There's a lot of NGOs out there asking for money. And mashallah, everyone's doing great work. But this is the kind of grassroots work that we need to support here natively in our you know, in our part of the world. So um, thank you very much for my guest, Abdurrahman, for joining us. And thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned to Muslimi for more amazing content. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and protect all of you. See you again soon. Zakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.